is a project engineer at Brown and Colwell with roughly six years of experience. She has worked in a mix of municipal and industrial wastewater design and construction projects, including facility pl uh, planning and process mechanical design. She was born and raised in Alaska. Her favorite things to do in her spare time all include getting outside into the mountains or the forest. And Emily Omoro. Uh, Emily is a project engineer, program manager, and project manager at Brown and Cowell with four years of experience. Her work has uh, primarily been on utilities, making the transition from traditional wastewater treatment to recycle water facilities and programs. In her spare time, you can find her in the foothills running with her dog. Hi, everybody, and welcome. You may have heard Emily and my names bandied around conference some this year. We were the notorious 2021 conference chairs. We were young professionals who were asked to take on a leadership role in this organization during a challenging time in its history. I won't bury the lead. It worked out okay. Otherwise, we wouldn't be up here standing in front of you. This year, we've received some recognition for those roles. We've been thanked for our leadership and guidance. We've been asked for advice. We've been praised for innovation and told we showed poise under stress. Um, those things felt really good to hear and I did share them with my friends, but I will tell you I'm up here talking about how to become a leader and I feel a bit like I'm faking it. Emily and I are at an interesting time in our career. We are no longer the newest employees, nor do we have 20 years of experience. We're graduating from some of the more prescriptive learning that takes place in the early years of a career and we're trying to define our next phase. Um, uh, as one does when we're stuck, we tried to crowdsource an answer to this problem. We talked with our networks and we asked for guidance from both sides. What do more junior staff need in order to transition into these leadership roles? And what do our current leaders need to see in the rising professionals in order to feel comfortable passing along some of their responsibilities? Everyone we spoke to, both experienced and junior staff, noted that there's no step-by-step -step instructions here which to two engineers was a real letdown. Uh, instead, we heard that it takes a lot of time to build trust and resiliency in this space. We also heard that if you're waiting for a moment when you feel completely comfortable to make these decisions and to lead a group without all of the information, you're gonna be waiting for a long time. You're going to need to stretch yourself into that role before you feel ready. However, there are ways you can practice both within your day job and outside. So similar to last year, Emily and I are up here before we feel ready, faking it to make it, trying on these roles and sharing our experiences and perspective before we feel completely ready to do so. In about 30 minutes, we're going to challenge you to do the same. Thanks, Allie. It's so crazy to me that the minute you start getting praised is the minute you start doubting absolutely everything. And this leadership word is such a loaded word. Like Ali said, in preparing for this conference, we didn't feel like we could be the ones to stand up here and give you a bunch of advice. So we crowdsourced like crazy. And over the next 30 minutes, I'm excited to share a lot of the really great advice that you all have given us. We are going to approach the topic of leadership from two angles, sort of the idea of a rising professional, that new young engineer or uh, person in their career. Ali and I are great examples. And then from the side of our current leaders, those people who are still in transition and growth and want to take on their own next opportunity, but are doing a lot of the leading within our organizations. So in talking to rising professionals, they shared that they often don't have the history on the projects they're coming into. And that context and background takes a long time to get up to speed on. They may be lacking the authority to affect the change that they really want to on these projects, especially if they don't have the backing of those current leaders. Rising professionals could also lack the confidence of solving these new types of problems because they've just absolutely never done it before. And if you have a rising professional who's got more confidence, then maybe that's a different kind of problem that we need to talk about another time. Our peers are eager to fill the shoes of current leaders. And I wish I could stress that just as much as I possibly could. They have incredible ideas, great energy, and they're so excited to try out their own path, forge their own new way of doing things but they still wanna learn from the leaders who are there. And I understand I'm like conflicting ideas are just coming out of my mouth over and over again. 
we heard that these rising professionals really value feedback. They want the opportunity to explore their own autonomy and the ownership of complex tasks, but they are afraid of failing at the same time. And I know that I'm asking to let us jump off cliffs, but still give us a safety net. And finding that bungee cord in the middle is absolutely the most typical balance of this whole process. What rising professionals want is time from their mentors, transparency in their own performance, and to be trusted with the next uh, step in their careers. So what are our current leaders saying? Our current leaders are those professionals who've had experience and they've got the institutional knowledge in our projects and organizations. Uh, maybe Emily and I only know awesome people. We do try to make it be that way. But of all the experienced leaders that we spoke to, they were all really excited about this topic. I think we saw some of that in the panel in the last session. Uh, they wanted to, they were engaged and they were trying to identify the best way to pass along this knowledge while acknowledging that it can be really challenging. The biggest limitation that we heard when we talked to our networks is the time that it takes. Uh, to make this knowledge transfer effective, we have to be efficient and really intentional about how we're sharing these experiences. To meet these goals, it takes relationship building and psychological safety on both sides. So you can see when we pair them together, those line up really nicely. Um, it's almost like someone was trying to make a point here. Uh, so from both sides, we're looking for the time from the others. Oh, it's one of our most valuable resources and recognizing that prioritizing this effort is what's going to make us successful in our industry going forward. It takes transparency, the ability to show up as ourselves, show and share our perspectives and know that we'll be valued on both sides. And both of these are hopefully leading to trust. One party able to grant autonomy and authority to the other while gifting them with feedback from a place of understanding. What we'd like to show is that both sides, rising and current professionals, are largely seeing this space with the same perspective. Uh, and clearly, they both have responsibility to this relationship to manage and grow it. So where do we need to use these skills? One of the things that we heard when we were talking to leaders in our networks was that one story, that pivotal moment that you tell that was probably terrible, but you got thrown in, you figured it out on your own and you're here and you're like, um, and this is how you would describe yourself. It's part of that moment. This is a common enough theme that we were able to find a Harvard Business Review article describing this. Um, and in this article, it, interviewing more than 40 top leaders in the business and the public sector over three years, all of them were able to point to an intense and often traumatic, but always unplanned experience that had transformed them and become the sources of their distinctive leadership abilities. The article identified four specific characteristics that showed how leaders came out stronger on the other side of that as opposed to burning out from these challenging experiences. The first was the ability to engage in shared meaning. We're a team against the problem, not a team against itself. The second is a distinctive and compelling voice, which I think really leans itself to the shared meaning. What's the story that we're telling it and how are we doing so? The third was a sense of integrity and a strong set of values. I'm hoping we can all agree on that one. It feels pretty intuitive. And finally, the most important thing that they identified was an adaptive capacity. So this is the ability to transcend adversity uh, with all of its stresses and to emerge stronger than you were before. They identified two primary qualities for this uh, adaptive capacity being the ability to grasp context and hardiness. So to me, that means grit. So what does this look like when it's done mostly successfully? Well, the year was 2020. And don't we all have crazy stories that start that way? Haley was PNCWA president. She turned to Allison and I and asked us to be her conference and program technical chair responsible for planning PNCWA 2021. She tempted us with tales of how we'd create the most uh, amazing conference yet, unlike any other in the past. And uh, when we said yes, we thought we were gonna deliver a conference that had daycare, an introvert room. Uh, we were going to open the door to new kinds of attendees and industries. And uh, this was gonna be the most inclusive conference we had ever seen. Uh, little did we know it was going to be a conference unlike any other. 
but absolutely not in any of those fun ways that we had <laughs> dreamed up when we said yes. Planning a conference takes insane amounts of work. We all get to show up every single day and get fed and learn something new and hang out with our friends and grow in our careers. And we just have to pay for it. The amount of work that goes in on a normal year is absurd. The year we signed up to do this was also the first year PNCWA didn't have a managing director. For years and years, there had been a group of people on the PNCWA side who were responsible for all of the administrative oversight. They carried the torch and the through line for every conference. Um, undeniably, we did have Meet Green as a conference organizer. They do so many of the details, take care of so many things that are out of my realm of even knowing needing to be happening, like these chairs being in this room, I would have forgotten the details. But there were still a lot of administrative tasks that without a managing director fell squarely on Allison and I, and in Haley's court to administer. It was just an immensely more amount of time. And then... 2020, there was a pandemic happening, raging the world. And uh, while we did say yes during the pandemic, we sort of have to take ownership for that one. Um, the pandemic was still in the phase where we were home for two weeks or maybe a month. We were all going to be back at our jobs by Christmas. And that is just absolutely not what happened. And during that pandemic, all of the hard work that Brittany Birch and Elliot had put into planning their own conference in 2020 had to be pivoted upon. They switched to a virtual summit. We didn't get a conference that year. And what that means is PNCWA lost its most important source of revenue. And so add to the top of this pyramid, we had limited funds in the bank and the risk of insolvency was actually very near on the horizon. What the heck did we <laughs> sign up for? <laughs> well, regardless of what we'd signed up for, we did sign up for it. We'd made a commitment to Haley and we had to get through it. And honestly, we're three women from Montana, Alaska, and Idaho, and this is where the mountain girl grit just like kicked in hardcore. We put on our hiking boots and stopped whining at the rain, and we just got down to work. The first thing we did is, well, I do wanna say that Haley had really granted us this ownership of all of the things that we were set to deliver. And genuinely, that high bar and expectation from her was oftentimes what got me putting those hiking boots out on and maybe yelling at the rain, but not whining for too long. <laughs> we started by really diving into those four things that, that Allison shared about the crucibles of leadership. We focused really solidly on our shared meaning. And the things that were in our control were the responsibility of delivering this conference, a responsibility that, that did come from Haley, but it also came from all of you, from this, our member organization. So we committed to creating a safe conference and doing it as inclusively as possible. Safety and inclusion, safety and inclusion, we came back to you all and what would make the most safe from a health and psychological perspective, that was the forefront of every single decision. And through this, we really did develop our own distinct voices. Allie actually told me yesterday that she remembers me harping safety, inclusion, safety, inclusion. And I probably maybe got annoying, but every time I had to come back to those words, it was the only thing that got me through. I remember Allie's voice constantly bringing it back to our members. What is this going to look like or feel like for the people who come into these spaces? What is it going to mean when we offer a technical track or get rid of a technical track? How do we keep all of you at the forefront of every decision? And she thought about it from the perspective of the, uh, the program itself and the way that she constantly was adapting our in-person and virtual offerings uh, many times throughout the, the planning period. We leaned on that strong set of values and I, <laughs> safety and inclusion are two of those values, but also we leaned into the fact that conferences matter. There are places where we all get to come together and connect and grow. We get really valuable CEU credits or whatever we need, but the, the most important is the fact that you're all sitting at a table with people you've come to know and trust, and that's gonna take us further beyond these walls. That adaptive capacity, my Lord, we tested it. And through the year of planning that was 2020, we tested it time and time again. And then the year of 2020 
became the year that was August of 2021, right before we were supposed to offer conference. We worked through contingency plan after contingency plan. Things were looking good. We were feeling great. And then Omicron hit and the world looked different. Uh, people were not able to join. Organizations were restricting who they could send to conference. We had municipalities that were, were restricting the size of gatherings. We didn't know if we could all be in the same room together. Uh, and the world just looked really different. Emily said, harping on safety and inclusion. I never said harping. We were glad that she was sharing those values and keeping us on point. <clears throat> so the only thing that really got us through August of 2021 was what we had built um, in the, our threesome, our relationship there over the last year. So when Haley brought us on board, she shared her vision with us. She gave us a chance to put our points of view into that vision as well. And she told us, here's your starting point. Here's A and B, your finish line. She did not tell us how to get there. That was something she allowed us to set our own path with probably some hand wringing in the background that she was kind enough to keep to herself. However, we also set up a series of check-ins and through working together and learning about each other, we realized what cadence we needed for those accountability checks when we needed feedback and any redirection. And also we created a safe space to ask for that feedback. We were comfortable with each other in order to be honest. <clears throat> Haley shared that when she brought us on board, um, it, this didn't look like a conventional choice. And quite frankly, there were some very concerned voices in the crowd asking what the heck she was thinking. And in fact, in prepping for this presentation, Emily and I re-asked her that question. And she shared that in her mind, trust isn't just earned, it's granted. If it has to be earned from the beginning, there's already a barrier to entry. So I heard a really good analogy for this in a book I was reading, Daring Greatly by Brené Brown, a clinical psychologist who studies leadership. And she shared that uh, trust is like a jar of marbles. So if you think back to elementary school, when your poor first grade teacher was wrangling a bunch of students and she's at her wits end, you guys probably had something like this. Essentially, when you're good, marbles go in the jar. When you're bad, marbles get taken out. And if at the end of the week, you've got a jar full of marbles, you get extra recess. Uh, my first grade teacher used a sticker chart, but that doesn't work as well for the clip art that I put on the PowerPoint. So uh, Brené Brown shares that trust is a slow building and iterative process. Uh, it happens in small moments and it happens over time. There's no shortcut. We spent a year valuing the small moments, both from our seasoned leader and from Emily and I showing that we could follow through on our commitments. And suddenly after a year of planning by September, 2021, we were each carrying around a full jar of marbles. Of course, we don't want you all to go through a traumatic and great, Haley, experience like planning a conference that is organization saving in the year of a global pandemic and unprecedented in all ways. But there are a lot of ways you can take these lessons and bring them um, through to your other work and a lot of other places where we found unexpected leadership lessons. So Brown and Caldwell organizes our technical leadership in what we call communities of practice. And the wastewater practice is led by Marie Burbano out of Florida. She's a wonderful engineer. And I'm one of the RPs, the rising professionals who sit on the facilitation side of this. And recently, we, in a, in a meeting with all of these technical experts, we asked uh, our entire wastewater practice um, a couple of key open-ended questions. I may have planted these for this conference, y'all. <laughs> the first question we asked was to our senior uh, and current leaders. We asked what's the kind of person you need to help you make the next step in your own career? And then we asked rising professionals, what do you want to learn or grow into next? And the results are in these figures. You'll see on the left side, I can not, I'm an engineer. We needed at least one graph in this presentation. So on the left, we've got the technical engineering skills. In that gray bar, our you know, senior current leaders are still looking for those technical experts. They still want that. 15 year PE unicorn engineer, but the energy and excitement from our junior engineers is greater. The excitement from young engineers to continue to grow their technical skills, that's like the zone where they feel the most excited. Everyone recognized leadership skills are still really important. There's 
a need for project managers, program delivery. There's a need for project analysts and support on all of these projects to get them done and a drive and willingness for our young professionals to go into that as well. But the last column is really fascinating to me. When we asked current leaders what they want in order to make the next step in their career, a lot of them said they're ready to be mentors. They're ready to pass on their skills to the next generation, and they want to intentionally take the time to do that. But when we asked rising professionals, they didn't say they were looking for mentors as frequently. And I think this comes from a fear that we all have, getting back to that imposter syndrome that we all experience. Seeing these current leaders who are so busy and productive and impressive, asking them to be our mentors is a really scary first step. And when I talked to a lot of our current leaders in this room, they shared, why on earth would I want to just corner a rising professional and tell them I want to teach them everything that I know? That seems crazy. <laughs> so there's imposter syndrome on both sides of this. I think what we need to walk away from is that we're all wanting some form of mentorship, and it just takes making that first awkward step. So when Ali and I first met, we actually met at PNCWA 2019. We are like forged in this organization. <laughs> Relationship goes way back. Um, but I was there presenting on uh, construction management with our PM, Mike Seltner, uh, on some of our city of Nampa work. And Allie was here with Josh Baker, a PM at the city of Boise, presenting on work she'd done at the West Boise treatment facility. And um, while the four of us felt like we all had technical presentations we were coming to wow you with, we got put in a workforce development track. And so we all pivoted and kind of catered our presentation a little bit to match the theme that we'd been placed in. And through that, after meeting Allie, we found, well, I just wanted to spend more time with her. I thought she was an awesome human and just wanted to continue to learn from her. And we found out that Josh and Mike had a huge history themselves. They'd worked on consulting projects in the past when they were both at the same employer. And when I found out that we had this sort of weird mesh, I sent the could have been super awkward email out saying, hey, want to get coffee? You could not find four more different people like Josh's favorite thing to do is hunting season, elk season. That's his go-to. Mike loves RVing with his wife. Allie and I, well, look at us. Um, but we have had such a great experience over the last three years. All four of us get together once a month, um, pretty much, and spend a, several hours together over coffee. It's been a ritual that's built a habit that I look forward to, and it's one of the most rewarding experiences um, to be in this mentorship circle with the three of them. So like Emily said, this is not a group that should work on its face. Uh, <laughs> what works for us is being a mentor and a mentee. Once you put a label on it, that relationship can get awkward. It feels like there's a lot of structure. It feels like there's rules. It feels like you have to prep for a meeting to have a conversation about what the next 20 years of your life is going to look like when you have no idea. So what this has done for us is it takes a lot of the pressure off. Instead of being one-on-one, -on -one, there are four of us. We're all responsible to show up prepared for this conversation. We take turns and we rotate topics. Um, somebody is always bringing something to discuss. We often have homework. We lean into the fact that we are engineers and we do like that structure. So I'm the podcast person. Josh brings us philosophical ideas from thousands of years ago. Yes, that happened two months ago. And Mike, we recently went through, okay, how are we storing all the information that ever comes into your life? These are the types of conversations that we're having. But over three years, it's something that we've all committed to. We prioritize it. And when we often have to reschedule, we make that effort. It's not something that we ever just let cancel or pass us by. We were thinking about sharing some of the specifics about what we talk about in this group, besides the very high level ones that I riffed off there. But honestly, we've created so much trust that it felt a bit like a violation to share some of the things that we've shared with each other. So outside of these two things, which are very much Emily's and I's path, um, we know that you all don't look like us. We're all unique. This will be different for everyone. So we've identified some other opportunities that might be familiar to you. Employee network groups. These are happening in our organization. We hear a lot about them and we're hoping that we're happy they're happening in yours. 
They're a place where you can raise your hand and automatically be granted a leadership role because they're so grateful to have you be participating. Um, you can broaden your perspective, work with people outside of your technical discipline and really learn from them there. There's also volunteering opportunities. We've listed some of the ones that Emily and I have been a part of. Engineers Without Borders, Water for People, you can sign up for that at conference. Future City, Girls on the Run, Boys and Girls Club, and shameless plug for PNCWA, because as Emily and I said, this is where we were forged. We have been granted so many opportunities from being a part of this organization. So we've talked about a few of the unexpected places, but there are also sort of unexpected opportunities. And I think we'd be remiss not to talk about all the vast amount of leadership development and skills you earn through all of our project work. But this does take a lot of intentionality. And so we, I wanna share a couple of stories. And um, I, I think that we can all think back to a pivotal project where someone granted us leadership, that person who took us under their wing on a project and helped forge the way, or maybe it's a junior engineer that uh, we're helping to bring along in our own way. Project work is absolutely one of the best ways I think we can pass along our skills. For me, this was facilitated through Brown and Caldwell's Deputy Program and Project Management Program, uh, which is a really intentional framework where senior project managers are paired with junior engineers. When I first started at Brown and Caldwell five years ago, I was bright eyed and bushy tailed. I was excited to take on anything and everything that came my way. And I could share so many stories of so many individuals at our organization and at our client organizations and contract other organizations that we partner with who have taken this on for me. But because we've already talked about Mike, I'd like to share what Mike did for me when I first started. I think I was slated to work on a preliminary design job for a side stream treatment, but Mike was in the midst of project management with Art Molseed as the program, a deputy delivery manager, and they were trying to manage uh, the preliminary design of the Nampa wastewater treatment plants phase two upgrades, which was at that time 165 million whole plant overhaul, um, adding new facilities and uh, updating old and existing ones. They had been working and building on the work done in the facility planning phases and we were revisiting some decisions, making progress on others. This work included business case evaluations, over 20 TMs. We were developing drawings, cost estimates. Uh, it also included all the other work that has to go along to get something like this off the ground. Uh, gave me exposure to the uh, alternative delivery model. We were developing a progressive design build contract, doing community engagement, customer outreach. Uh, just everything was embedded in this. And as the program manager and project manager, Mike was responsible for delivering and meeting all of those deliverables. Well, since my piece of the project was a little slow to kick off, I just kept knocking on Mike's door, asking for things to do and wanting more opportunities. And he... Finally, I guess, threw something over the fence and said, well, you can work on the earned value spreadsheet. I must have been a total sucker. Like now that I'm like do project management and learn EV is like everyone's like least favorite word. I got thrilled. I was so excited to own a piece of this project. I built a spreadsheet from scratch. This thing is massive, like 300 lines, embedded formulas. I was running around uh, talking to all the senior leaders about how far their deliverables were, what the status was. He had the best EV at Brown and Caldwell. Martha, I'm telling you, it was spot on. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> um, the, but what this did in Mike giving me something to own that really was not as consequential as I took it to be, um, was enabled me to make those connections. I was out talking to each of these senior technical experts and getting to know them on a personal level. It enabled me to go to those client meetings and get in the room with people. When a few years later, we were able to walk on site and uh, do some of our construction management work. My background is in chemical engineering, so I'd actually never learned any of the wastewater process that was there. So having the full broad spectrum given to me through managing that EV spreadsheet, when I walked on site, I at least had a, a better understanding of how everything connected, where all the parts and pieces plugged and played to make our amazing systems work and function. It also gave me a huge sense of ownership. The fact that I knew these people and was able to be a part of this incredible project moving forward. So when we were talking to Mike a couple of weeks ago at our mentor circle, I shared this example and I was like, you were so nice to just sort of like pass that over to us. 
And he was like, oh, well, here's like the ways that we do really effective delegation and project management. And these are the frameworks and advice I would give. And it was all part of his friggin' plan. He like laid it all out and had this whole framework for how he f- approaches leadership and delegation that I just sort of like lucked myself into. But these things on the left with the black boxes are themes that we heard from a lot of people. We heard from Vicki Hollingsworth asking her, uh, many, many others in our network. And these pieces of advice, I think, are really pivotal and standard. The first thing that we were offered was creating the space. When you have something that needs to happen, step away from it first as a current leader, and then see who walks up and attempts to fill that gap. I think as a rising professional, what this means for me is when you see a void, feel excited and engaged to step into that gap. But here I am as an outgoing white woman who's educated, neurotypical, that opportunity is something and privilege is something that I'm privileged to be able to do. I think if we could amend this create the space advice, we would say create the space and then clearly reach down and help someone else fill it. Another piece of advice that Mike gave is be a realistic delegator. He talked about how he would pass something off to me and then let me fumble around for a little bit or a long bit and then check in. And at that end point, when I thought I was done, he expected 50% back, 50%. He knew that it was going to take a lot of diligent time and effort. And hopefully the next time he'd see 75% back and then hopefully 90% after the next round. And then he would finish it off at the end and tell me all the edits that he'd made to make it the way that he actually wanted to see things presented. I think that's an impressive scheduling and and forward-looking way to delegate material to young engineers. What it means for me as a rising professional and something I absolutely have to work on, it means you have to meet your deadlines. Means that if you think this is sort of a washy schedule and I really have four more weeks, you're actually robbing yourself of the time you would be able to. Uh, edit and work together with your mentors to create something better. A lot of our uh, people in our network's current leaders spoke about enabling a fail-safe environment. Where are those bungee cords we talked about earlier? And this means you have to identify tasks that are important and singular, but also don't have super high consequences if they come back totally awful, or at least you have the opportunity to fix them. My earned value spreadsheet was perfect (laughs) because it was something that was important and opened the door for a lot of other things, but it wasn't going to break Brown and Caldwell. It wasn't going to ruin a client relationship. What this means for us as rising professionals is asking for help and feedback. And all of that help and feedback that we get will help us not fail as horribly in the first place. And everyone we talked to talked about adopting a pay it forward attitude thinking about and entering all of those interactions and conversations, remembering all of the advice and support we've gotten in the past and carrying that attitude and ethos into our interactions. I don't think that uh, changes at all for our rising professionals. We also need to adapt a, a pay it forward attitude and give back to those rising professionals who are rising even below us. So we've talked a lot about this being an iterative process. And while we'd love to put steps one, two, and three on it, and Mike got pretty close, um, (laughs) we don't think it works that way. Uh, From our discussions, there are some general guidelines. There's some suggestions that we've shared that you can take or leave, or maybe have prompted some ideas of your own. Uh, But this will be unique to you and your peers. We would argue that from our experience, there's no right way to do this. There's probably some wrong ways, but there's no wrong first step. So we would challenge you to take that awkward first step, to seek someone out to volunteer with, to invite someone that you admire who you don't feel qualified to talk to to coffee, or to look down and to pull someone and encourage them to come to coffee with you. And we're going to ask you to go ahead and do those things. And if you need an accountability partner, feel free to email Emily and I, because we all need that, and share your success stories and share your not so successful stories, because Emily and I will be right there with you, not succeeding sometimes. We know this is a cyclical process. We know that we are looking to our mentors to create space for us, to share their wisdom, to provide feedback. And we know that there are young professionals who are now charging up behind us, who are asking for our time, our transparency, and our trust. 
And we're up here taking our next awkward first step before we feel ready. And we are really inviting and hoping that you will join us. So thank you. <laughs> Questions? I'm carrying this around. I'm not asking. So if you have questions, I'll <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful presentation, by the way. And as a, uh, um, my name is Rob Lindsay. I work for Spokane County. I'm the Environmental Services Administrator here. And uh, I'm 62 years old. I'm kind of on the trailing edge of, uh, of the retiring community. But I was very interested in the, um, in the mentorship gap. That, that, you, that you mentioned and how uh, some of the emerging or the current leaders are saying, gee, where's people I can mentor her? And maybe, you know, those that aren't, you know, the, the, the younger rising professionals maybe aren't looking for that. It, this is less of a question than a comment. And that um, what I've learned over time is many times you're a mentor and you don't know it. Mentors aren't assigned, um, you know, and so, my advice to, uh, to the more senior folks in the room is to you know, really pay attention to those crucibles of leadership and really pay attention to young, you know, rising engineers such as yourself who, who have excellent communication skills, by the way. So again, just be mindful of that and understand that mentorship is not assigned, it's, it's not delegated. Mm -hmm. And and just be aware that you may not be aware that you are already a mentor in ways that you just don't understand. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're watching for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I really appreciated your your feedback and your guidance about how to give tasks and delegate, you know, the 50, 90 percent. I think that's really smart. In your outreach to people. What are you finding, especially in this remote work environment? Because my thoughts would be, there's a lot of time pressure, people are really busy, and I would think that it's rather spotty, depending on who is really good at checking in and understanding what an entry-level person or an inexperienced at whatever task they're given. So I'm, I'm just curious to see what you found and if more trainings needed to the, you know, the mid and senior level managers on, on expectations and, and planning. Um, and I, I think it's a practice. This is something that I'm not great at either. You know, sometimes you lay it out, what's in your head. I've been really clear and you weren't, um, I wasn't. So I think when you're starting, what's been successful to me is when I'm first in that relationship with somebody is really digging in, expecting that you're gonna get less than you would have thought and usually you'll be surprised. They went in a direction that you didn't expect. So I think it's really in new relationships where you don't necessarily see how they think yet or how they've been performing previously, where you have to be intentional about setting those interim deadlines. I think once you've been working with somebody for a while, those things flex, right? Um, and you may have to revisit it on new and different tasks and you'll be surprised in some places. We can't plan for everything, but I think it's really when you're first starting with somebody that you need to set, take the time and know that this is a process. We're all really, really busy and just setting it as a priority, knowing that building these relationships and mentoring like this is almost equally as important as some of our deliverables. So that would be my advice. And I would just say, we feel really lucky that we started our careers pre-pandemic in a world where we could go knock on doors and ask people uh, questions. I think you're right, it's, it's way harder in a virtual setting. A few things in the virtual side that I've seen work really well is, is starting to fill that marble early with personal interactions. Oftentimes we start calls with a icebreaker question, just helps you open the door to, to learn more about people. And luckily we're in a space now where you can still go get coffee and come back into that realistic world. And I think that opening the door and starting to grant that trust early on a personal front is an easier way to, to start building those reactions um, and interactions and relationships. Good morning. Um, 
so I just wanted to speak a little bit about uh, the volunteering at the PNCWA. So uh, my, my career was on an upward platform and it hit a spot where I was pretty much dead ended. And I was really kind of losing faith in the, in the, in the industry and stuff. And, and I got involved with PNCWA at a time where there was a lot of change going on, kind of like right now. And I was able to really build my leadership skills by volunteering and working with people. Um, I would recommend anybody getting involved with an association or other because you can really do a lot. I, I really, um, my faith in this industry came back in this organization and I was able to excel and, and do wonderful things. So great presentation. And I'd like to echo that Ed was one of those people on the conference committee who helped us get through 2021. So thank you, Ed. <laughs> and I think we were given the cutoff sign, so that's all we have time for, but we really appreciate your time. Thank you.